Right, yeah. So the, and the neighbors would just drift in and watch shows and send me going. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> so you were like the movie theater. Yeah. 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 Oh yeah. I was just talking to another member today who's temporarily homebound, and we were talking about <laughs> she's got a pool table she wants to get rid of, and I said we don't have the basement for it, but I always had this idea uh, because of the way I grew up. We grew up in this you know rural area, long stretch of road, but there were seven boys in roughly my age group, and. Uh, we, but we always collected at Joe's house because Joe's stepfather had a pool table in the basement. Mm -hmm. And the thing about playing pool is that you can talk while you do it. Like, you know, you can't do and pick, do, we do pick up basketball and football and stuff too, but you, you, you don't talk when you're doing those things. And I always thought that would be such a, a great way to like, keep my finger on the pulse of the kids in the neighborhood and stuff like that. But we haven't needed it in our sons a year from going to college, so. Yeah. <laughs> I had weights in my basement. Okay. Mm -hmm. Weight sets and, you know, put up, like my son was a wrestler. And Bless you. And a bus was buddy of a wrestler, so a football player or something like that. Mm -hmm. And they come to my house and hear all this clanking and carrying on. Uh -huh. But you know what? I knew where they were. Yep, right. exactly. 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 I knew where they were. They were not out roaming the streets. They were at my house. They were whatever they were doing down there, having fun, yelling, oh, I didn't mm -hmm. care. Yep, yeah, that's 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 with our that's kids it. too, yeah, we've got going, we've got friends that come over, and it's chaos in the house when they're there, but our I'm just house. so glad they know everything is good when they're at our house. And our house was Grand Central Station. That's great. They put all his buddies, and they that's all awesome. came, and they, they were all good kids, uh -huh. they all turned out good. One owns the Melt, the Blue, and all those restaurants. Uh-huh, oh right. Yes, Georgie Paxis is his name. Uh-huh. He was at my house, he grew up poor. Uh-huh. He owns all those restaurants. Oh, uh, the other wow. thing, David Priestess, he has his own uh, uh, company that uh, does uh, tri uh, like trucks and, and even in part of the railroads. Mm -hmm. and these are all kids that came to the house all the time. Came from the local the, neighborhood. Uh, all made out. That's, that's awesome. fantastic. And we had the queen boards. The kids were in the queens at that point. Uh -huh. And we did have a pool table because when her dad lived with this, he passed away. So. That was one of the things that we did to try to keep things moving in the house. Mm -hmm. and, and then all the guys were over all the time. It was pool, or most of the time it was weights. Mm -hmm. They played more weights than anything. Mm -hmm. And we could always hear the weights hit the board. We never, yep. uh -huh. we knew they were there. And sure. Yeah. Yeah. We only lost one kid one night <laughs> when we had the uh, drum line showed up at the door. <laughs> I just got home from work and <laughs> The doorbell rings and there's a girl there from church and with her mom and she's holding her sleeping bag and her pillow and I guess the look on my face she says you don't know and I said you know what <laughs> well the drum line is staying over tonight I said oh okay well you're the first one here come on in <laughs> <laughs> that's great they were having sleepovers uh, a different, a different oh that yes I remember many of, one of the kids, sleepovers were great they got cold so they came in the house in the basement well, there wasn't enough room on chairs and, and the floor for everybody, so one ended up under the sofa mm. because that's where he found room. And then in the morning, nobody knew where he was. <laughs> and we had collected all the keys. The keys were next to our bed. Mm -hmm. so no one, but then we found out years later that somebody else came and took them. <laughs> but we didn't know they were gone. Right, right. Well, um, I didn't bring the hymnals in tonight. Uh, I'm going to start by... Uh, just singing briefly a verse of a hymn for you to get us started. Uh, remember, this was supposed to, we were supposed to do this last week uh, for St. Patrick's Day. It was supposed to be the, our kickoff on the discussion of the Bible, but we got caught in a horrible traffic jam because of an accident. So um, it was so weird because by the time we got to where the accident was, it was completely cleaned up, but there was a massive scorch mark, like, like a car had actually burned on the highway. So, um, so we don't know what happened to this day. I never, I never checked the news to see what went on. So, um, so this is um, St. Patrick, uh, obviously famous as the evangelizer of Ireland, um, has a tremendous uh, backstory, which I won't go into tonight. But um, probably the, the most important piece we have of, of, of his work, in addition to his life story, um, which was written down by someone else, uh, is what is called his Lorca. Uh, or his hymn. Um, this is a prayer that's attributed to him. Um, no reason to think it doesn't go straight back to him. Um, 
I'm not reading in a strict translation. Uh, I don't remember when, maybe 80 years ago, someone took uh, his, his Lorica and put it into hymnic form so we could sing it on Sunday mornings. But I have discovered by trying to sing it on Sunday mornings that it's a tough thing for a whole congregation to sing. Uh, <laughs> so it's, it sounds very Irish. You can hear it when I sing it, uh, that they did a good job of the melody. But um, this, is, uh, this is the fifth, fourth verse of the hymn. Um, and in the hymn, he, uh, it, it's, very, it's very Celtic in flavor, where he's, he, it's sort of riffing on the full armor of God stuff from the book of Ephesians, where he's strapping onto himself spiritual armor for the, for the day ahead. Um, and this makes sense to me that this would go back to him because here's a, here's a guy who was abducted as a kid, sold into slavery, um, faced down battle chieftains um, with some tremendous great stories about how he did that uh, to bring the gospel to Ireland. So this is the fourth verse. I bind unto myself today the power of God to hold and lead his eye to watch, his might to stay, his ear to hearken to my need. The wisdom of my God to teach, his hand to guide, his shield to ward, the word of God to give me speech, his heavenly host to be my guard. So, um, that the, the various aspects you heard there of, of living life in Christ, God leads, he guides, he watches, his might to stay, to, to stop the power of, of enemy attacks is what that refers to. Um, hearkening to our need, his wisdom to teach us, his hand to guide, his shield to ward us. Um, and then finally, the goal is that, and I thought, it's, it's, I love the way this is done, the word of God to give me speech. Now we think of the word of God, we're asking for ears to hear, but he's asking that the word of God be in his mouth so that he's so formed by the word of God that what he speaks is directly reflective of Jesus's thought and Jesus's um, intent, and um, as as we do that, as you as we hear that, um, that's what that's really what we're going to be getting into with looking at the Bible as the Word of God. Um, the Word of God is first and foremost uh, God's message to us, but the goal of the Christian life is to be so thoroughly formed by the Word. Not that you're quoting it all the time, although it doesn't hurt to have some quotes committed to memory, but that you're, you're formed in a way that your, your way of thinking and living and therefore speaking is reflective of the content of Scripture as rightly understood. So uh, let's start with a word of prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Gracious God, as we come together tonight to consider the word which we love, the word which forms us, the word which reveals you to us, and which your Holy Spirit uses to bring us to faith, the books that we refer to as the Holy Scriptures. We ask, O oh Lord, of the things that from you that Patrick asked. We, we ask that you would guard us and shield us from the attacks of the enemy, that you would guide our thoughts, our minds, our questions, that you would uh, give us speech according to your word, graciously to uplift and uphold one another. And finally, that you would hearken to our need, for we wish truly, O oh Lord, to learn who you are, what you wish for our lives, and to be conformed to your will. This we ask in the precious name of his name, which is above all names, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So, um, the Bible uh, in, in Lutheran circles has historically typically been referred to as the Word of God. But it's not the only thing that gets referred to as the Word of God, so it, gets a, it can get confusing. So what other ways have you heard of the Word of God referred to? There's sort of three classic ways 
we talk about the Word of God. Jesus is the word. That's the first and primary one. Yeah. The word of God is Jesus himself. Right? Allah, John 1, 1. Then the second one is what we've already referred to. The Holy Scriptures. And anyone want to guess what the third one is? We don't talk about this enough. But we just heard about it from St. Patrick. Give us a hint. Huh? We need more hints. We need more hints? <laughs> we, just, we just heard about it from St. Patrick. I emphasized it pretty hard. The word of God to give me speech. It's the conversation of the church. Actually, and in, in, in the Lutheran, what are called the seven marks of the church, it's referred to as the conversation and consolation of the saints. Now remember, saints does not mean especially holy people who get their own stained glass windows. It's all of us together. Um, so... It's, it's the word of God alive among us, building each other up, okay? Um, Lutherans will talk about the means of grace. How does, God doesn't just drop into our, our headpan and give us direct inspiration all the time. Um, I know I often wish he would. <laughs> um, but what he does is he works through people around us. So we pray for healing, right? Does that mean we don't go to doctors like Jehovah's Witnesses? No. <laughs> or Jehovah's Witnesses, you go to doctors, they don't get blood transfusions. I went too far. But it was a bridge too far. But the idea, we still go to doctors because God has gifted some people with the gift of healing, and God can use medical attention. Um, there's a movie uh, just out. It's, been, it's one of those Fathom Events things you can go to, and you have to get a ticket ahead of time. And it's in like limited engagement theaters. It was last Monday and next Monday. But it's about a guy named Nectarios from Greece, who's known as a healer. He, in, in the Orthodox tradition, he's the patron saint of cancer patients. But, and it's, it's this, the woman who wrote the script and directed the movie just loved this guy. And, um, but, you know, in the movie, you see, apparently, I haven't seen it yet. I'll see it when it comes out on Amazon or something. But um, you see him sending people to doctors. Even though he is attributed with having done miraculous things, he sends people to doctors. Now, this guy lived in the 20th century. This is not ancient history. So even though he prayed for miraculous healing, he also sent people to doctors. We believe God works through means. In the life of the church, the two chief means that God uses, not only to create faith, but to sustain it in this life, when it's challenged constantly, what we refer to as the means of grace, are the reason you've got pastors. The word and the sacraments. So the word alive in speech among us is the most direct application and the one most Christians have experienced. Apart from their direct relationship with Jesus, more Christians have experienced this than the reading of the Holy Scriptures because most Christians throughout time have not been literate. Most people know the Scriptures. They've heard the pastor say often enough times that they memorize it. Or they sing it in the liturgy. One reason that they took a lot of Bible passages that were critical and organized them for singing is that so you could memorize them. And they translated them all into Latin and no one knew what they were saying anyway. Uh, which is why Luther pushed to take it back to the local languages, which was the practice of the early church, just so you know. The early church, until the time of Gregory the Great, which is the 600s, am I remembering right? Or five late, late 500s. Late 500s. Um, until then, the church always translated the worship service into the local language of the people so they could understand it and memorize the scriptures. But um, the conversation and consolation of the saints, the first place of conversation is the pastor's preaching. Then, if you're like the, the, the family I married into, where I got a lot of my stereotypes about Christians, dis I was disabused of those, um, 
I would go to I would go to worship with my uh, my girlfriend and then fiance on Sunday mornings with her grandmother, and then on the way home they would tear the sermon apart. <laughs> so that when I I knew that when I became a pastor they'd be doing the same to me. That was great news. But uh, but but it starts the, the pastor preaches, and then we did you hear that? And then we talk about it, we discuss it, and then you know, and that's so it's alive in our midst, and that's the word of God active in the midst of the people of God. And it's always amazing how two people can hear the same thing and come away with two different yeah, that's true. Uh, viewpoints. Right? Yes, <laughs> that is that is why when you see me preaching from the pulpit, especially if I if you can tell I'm reading this my my text, it's because I'm tackling one of those really sensitive issues that when someone says you said this, Pastor, I can say no, I said this, <laughs> and show them this. <laughs> You might have heard that, but here's what I said, <laughs> you know. And, and I know full well you can't control what people hear, but when it's something that could, um, that's really sensitive for people, I really want to tackle it in a way that there's a point of reference. So if people mishear me, and I count on the fact that a lot of times when people mishear, it's the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. leading their thoughts in a particular way. Yeah, I was going to say, I think that's why people hear things differently. It's like, you yeah. feel like the Holy Spirit is working there and it's, yeah. it's bringing certain things to the different end. Different times you hear things differently yeah. too, depending on what's going on in your own life. Exactly. Exactly. It you know, touches you differently. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and, and that's why I don't usually worry about it. Um, I have occasionally had people get the exact reverse of what I was trying to say. And um, that'll come come back when we get into the conversation about the scriptures. But but usually if they're getting the exact reverse of what I want to say, that's a bad thing because I work really hard to preach what the Bible actually says and not my private opinion. The last thing you want is a pastor who preaches their opinion. A lot. <laughs> um, we are called upon, in fact, we take a vow at our ordination to preach and teach according to the Holy Scriptures and the Lutheran Confessions. The Confessions not being understand, not being understood to be equal to the Scriptures, but as a faithful interpretive guide, mm -hmm. a faithful understanding of the Scriptures. But that implies there is a right and a wrong way to understand the Scriptures. So I'm not supposed to be up there offering, here's what I feel today, and you know, I've been reading this latest thing, and this is where I'm at. So we're going to focus uh, at least tonight and probably next week also on the Word of God, because I really want to... We're working so hard. I love that our congregation is getting into the scriptures and learning them. And there's a long history of this congregation of the Bethel Bible series. And now we've got the one-year Bible going and stuff. I love that our people are in the Word. I want to make sure we get at how to read the scriptures. And so I've been, I've been twisting it in my brain, trying to figure out like what are the most important things to cover. Because I'm, I am, like I said on Sunday, I, I mean, I, I'm geeky with this knowledge. And I, like, I can just run down rabbit trails all day. So... I've been trying to find a way to keep it um, easy for everyone, and I, I came up with an acronym I'm, I'm very proud of. <laughs> so don't, don't, don't tell me it's bad. <laughs> I'm, just I'm just kidding. Um, we're called to read the scriptures. Um, we're not going to do those, th those two letters. It still reads the same call, but I, I, I added them back in, so it's a real word. So we're, we're going to get into, we're called to the word of God. Um, we're called by the Spirit, right back to the text of the Holy Scriptures. Um, so I'm going to take you through my, my clever little acronym, um, and I don't care if you remember it. I'm just I'm trying to help. <laughs> I'm trying to like make it memorable. How do we read the Scriptures? So um, I want to start just with that that language, um, because Word of God can apply to more than one thing. A, a, a more technical description of the Bible would be Holy Scriptures. Come on in. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. So, so the Holy Scriptures, just breaking it down, this is what I love to do. What does the word Scripture mean? Just the right the word, word of God. Hmm? No? Good guess. That would, hmm? Script is right. Script. You ever, most of us knew how to print and then how to write in script, right? Or once upon a time. Now I don't even know if they teach that anymore. But um, So yeah, scripture literally means writing. That's all it means, right? Adding holy to it 
the holy writings, these things that come down to us and are recognized, uh, have been recognized by the church. Now forget most of what you ever learned about how we got the Bible, because most of it's been on A&E or Discovery Channel, and there's so much ridiculous misinformation there, it's not even funny. Um, I remember probably 10 years ago now, when the Da Vinci Code came out, and uh, Ian's godmother, who was a girl I used to have in youth group back in the 90s, called me and she said, Brett, you need to read this book, because all your parishioners are going to be reading this, but, but I want you to take a, a large glass of wine before you start, <laughs> because it's so full of mistakes, your blood pressure is going to shoot through the ceiling. Um, the most popular thing that, that that the most popular era that book um, popularized was that the Council of Nicaea voted on which books were in the Bible and which ones were. It didn't. <laughs> it's never been voted on which books are in and which books are. Never. Um, we have the scriptures we have because the church, the people of God, who start by hearing the word of God, prophets and, and people like Moses, uh, whatever, they, they experience this, they write down what happened, that's the writing part, and over time, certain books get recognized as having the touch of God on them. And it's not just pastors or bishops who make this decision. They debate it back and forth too. It's people like you who decided which were in and which were out. And it was very simple how you did it. We will hear these ones read in church, or we won't. So there are several books, um, you, as you probably know, there are several books in the Old Testament that Catholics have in their Bible that Protestants typically don't. There's a history to that. Um, there are some Catholics that have even more books than that in their Bible. If you're from a Slovakian country, did you, did you grow up with 4th Esdras in your, in your Bible? Yeah, that's only in the Slovakian countries they have that. If you go to the church in Ethiopia, they've got some books in the New Testament we don't have. <laughs> so there's ne it's really, in large part, what people will hear read in worship that determines whether it's the Bible or not. And it's not just who wrote them. Because, for instance, if you go to, I encourage you to go when you go home, open up 1 Corinthians. And here's how it begins. As I wrote to you in my last letter. That means Paul wrote another letter that didn't make it into the Bible. <laughs> Apparently, people just didn't have a sense that the Holy Spirit had touched him in the writing of that book. And so they didn't copy it and say, the church down the road needs to hear this. <laughs> um, and so that's, that's how you end up with this. So it's largely the people who in part determine what ends up in the Holy Scriptures. So the, the holy people of God are recognizing the Holy Spirit's voice speaking through the Scriptures. Okay, So that's how we end up with the Scriptures we have. And it's way complicated. If you want to know the actual technical things of which one was included and why and when, and I could go through all that with a little bit of boning up on my own history because I don't know all of it off the top of my head. But that would be like a graduate level course in canon formation, like for your, your master's degree or something like that. And that's probably boring to all of you, so I don't want to go there tonight. Um, what I do want to do is, is talk about, per our, our, the outline of this class, how we approach the scriptures as the word of God and what we mean by that. So um, the first thing, I'm just going to move that. The first letter in our in our acronym is is C, and this is contextual. So we read them contextually. Okay, so what do I mean by contextually? When I say we read the Bible in context, what do I mean? Face value, basically. We're going to get to that with L. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. 
Um, right now, I, I'll, I'll give you an example from our, our kids uh, are in the same homeschool group and they're doing this group chat on their on thing where they're decontextualizing each other's quotes. So somebody says a quote and people think, that sounds really funny if you don't know the conversation that it came from. And then they put it out into this thread so the kids can all laugh at it. Um, so what was Elizabeth's quote the other day about? Oh, gotta get me some. Oh, gotta get me some cold, frothy goodness. <laughs> she was talking about seeing a Coke commercial. And her brother's like, that's great! <laughs> Types it in and sends it off to their friends so they can guess what she was talking about, okay? Um, so we read it contextually. Um, and so every passage of scripture has a context. Um, so what are some of the things that help form our context for, for any passage of scripture? The time. Say more about that. The time. The time that it was took place in. Yeah, okay. And yeah. place. Yeah, okay. Time and place. So his that's your historical context, right? What else? What's another part of the context? Culture. Culture, yeah. Culture is especially important because we're, we live in a world where culture is shifting constantly. Do you know how many English translations there were of the Bible until 1950? One. Now you can go to your local, not even a Christian bookstore anymore because there aren't too many of them left. You go to a regular bookstore and there's 50 translations into English of the Bible because it's all about copyrights and who gets the royalty check. So now we're going to have a new translation of the Bible, not, just, not because necessarily the old one was bad, but because someone, this company owns the copyright and we don't get paid if it gets sold. So now we're going to develop our own translation. Okay. Um, and, and what's happening culturally is that we're changing so fast that words don't mean the same things 30 years later that they meant 30 years ago. So the, many people have copies of the New International Version of the Bible. It's a really, it's actually a really decent modern translation. Um, when I was going to a more progressive seminary, we had uh, in our in our in my New Testament classes. We had learned Greek, and we were learning to translate from the Greek. And every week, we had a couple of things, a couple of passages we needed to translate. And every week, when my professor would get excited, Dr. Carlson would start going, "Oh, here's this thing the English translation doesn't get right." What he meant was the English translation our denomination used. And so I had most of my most of my friends had a Bible that had like two columns. It had the Greek, and then the New Revised Standard Version, the NRSV, here. And, every, and he started, He did this so many times, he said, here's this thing the English translation doesn't get right. But my, my Bible had three columns. I had the Greek down the middle, and then on one side the NRSV, the New Revised Standard Version, and on the other side the NIV. Well, every time he said, here's something the English translation misses, I looked over at the NIV and they got it right. <laughs> and it happened enough times I started keeping score in the back of my book. So by the end of the class he had done it 11 times. <laughs> and the NIV got it right every time the NRSV got it wrong. But the NIV was written in 1984. Was the translation was published. It's been republished because the words it used are out of date now. The, meaning the English words. The Greek hasn't changed. <laughs> but what, what the English words mean to an English-speaking audience has changed so much, they felt like, we better put out a new version. <laughs> you know, we better revise it a little bit. So yeah, culture's a big one. What's, what's another context? What's another part of the context? I, sorry, I get warm when I teach. I get worked up. The author? Okay, yeah. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, the author's going to be part of their culture, but yeah, the author. Yeah. How does each, how does each author use certain words, even within the same, relatively same cultural context? The word sign in the Gospel of John does not mean the same thing as it does in the Gospel of Mark. As a for instance. Okay, even though John and Mark probably knew each other and definitely were in the same cultural context. <laughs> they were using the words slightly differently. What 
What other contexts? Trying to, I'm not trying to trick you, I promise. <laughs> Who are you talking to? Yeah, okay, yeah, intended audience, yeah. To me, also, kind of what was said before it. Yes, yeah. Um, our kids are really into anime right now. This is Japanese style animation and they watch all this stuff in translation from Japan. These are, and this, I guess this is true in general of things that kids are watching today. They have what they, I hear my kids talking and they talk like, and they, they speak in a way about stuff they watch on television that I spoke about as an English major my freshman year of college. And I never talked like that in high school. What they talk about all the, all the time are story arcs. Well, you know, Dad, that story arc over there, this is what's going on. What's going on? Where does it fall in the story, right? Like, that's a big part of the context for what goes on, is where it falls in the story. And within scripture, in particular, there are tons of interlocking story arcs. So those of you who uh, came to Vespers last night, you heard me preach about how this one little section of Genesis 22 is almost like the whole gospel encapsulated. The whole arc of our salvation is reflected in this one little thing. But I don't know it from reading that one little thing. I know it because I know the story from Genesis to Revelation. So there's all these interlocking story arcs that a good reader of scripture starts to know. Right, um, a good reader of scripture starts to know them, so they start to know the context in which it falls. And I used to know who this quote came from. I think it's either Craig Evans or D. A. Carson, who are both uh, Bible translators and theologians. But their dad, one of the two of them, their I think it's one of the two of them, their father had a con had a, a quote, and he used to say, um, "A text without a context is a pretext for a proof text." How's that? <laughs> and I was so proud. A couple of years ago, we had a congregation member go off to seminary. And uh, she, she'd heard me say it enough times that she quoted it to her New Testament professor. And he goes, oh, that's good. Did your pastor teach you that? I was like, <laughs> yeah, a text without a context is a pretext for a proof text. Um, now, just to break that down a little bit, meaning if you don't read the texts in the context they're meant to be read in, what you're doing, what you're looking for, is a chance to support something you've decided already on non-biblical grounds. You're looking for the Bible to endorse what you want to talk about or what you want to preach or teach instead of you sitting in the passenger seat and learning from Scripture. Instead of the, instead of the Scripture being the teacher and I'm the student, I'm trying to flip the script. I'm trying to put myself on top where I know, I'm, I'm sure God wanted to say this, so now I'm going to find evidence in the Bible to support my way of thinking. Um... And that's the opposite of the way that we're supposed to read the Bible. Um, and that's going to take us right on to our second letter. So, um, any, any questions about this? Does this make sense? Now, it doesn't mean it's easy. I've got... We've got 66 books in our Bible, written over a span of about 1,800 years. Does not, if I, have you ever tried to go back and read, for instance, the Canterbury Tales in the Old English, not in a translation? This is English, but you need to translate it into English to read it. And that's in, what, the 800s? She teaches the literature for the homeschool group, so she's more familiar, she remembers the dates better. 1200s? Okay, so only, that's what I said, 800 years ago, right? So about 800 years ago, and we can't go back and read it. 
let alone to read texts that were written over the course of 1800 years. And then the most recent one was written about 1900 years ago. So these, it takes a lot. It's a storytelling tradition. And in large part, if you go to the Gospel of Luke and hear some of the comments Jesus makes, unless you've read Genesis, you're not going to understand what he's talking about. He talks about, you know, it's better for Sodom and Gomorrah in that day than it's going to be for this group. I don't know what Sodom and Gomorrah means. <laughs> unless you've read Genesis, and then you, then you get it. So the context keeps rolling. And the, the overall context for our understanding is from uh, the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation. This is the whole, the largest story arc. And within it are all these little stories that help us learn, help us reflect, help us see patterns. St. Paul will talk a lot about this in Romans. He'll talk about the way that the story of Abraham and Sarah and Hagar and Ishmael and Isaac, his, his, you know, the great father of faith, his wife, his concubine, and his two children by two different women, teaches us about what it means to be in the church or outside the church. To be children of the promise or not children of the promise. So, so, because it's a repetition in an earlier form of the story that is the big story, okay? And so this happens again and again throughout history. God knows we are thick and stubborn, and he repeats himself so we can understand him. <laughs> so this is the way we learn to read scripture, Okay? And usually when we go wrong in the church is when we decontextualize a scripture. I'm going to talk a little bit more when I get to the letter D probably next week um, about the reflection on, on how we hear the word addressed to us personally. But context is a big thing. So I'm going to give you an example from, that's very popular in um, modern Christianity. Has anyone ever heard of the prayer of Jabez? What is it? Do you remember? Or can you give me, you don't have to give it as a quote, but do you, do you know what the general? He was asking to have his um, enlarged, his, uh, yeah, his inheritance or his, yeah, yeah. his borders, his, borders, the, yeah. the land he had, he had, res yes. he was responsible for. Yes. Yeah. Because, now, yeah, we, a group of us used that prayer, we actually did pray it. Sure. Yeah. And, and in a sense, there's nothing wrong with it, right? There was a book called The Prayer of Jabez probably 20 years ago now that got very, very it's popular. Cool. It's been, um, but here's a classic example of decontextualizing a prayer. It's not wrong to pray that prayer as long as you understand the context in which it's offered. So where it's offered is it's, it's listed in the midst of a long genealogy, like I read on Sunday from the Gospels, or it was just name after name after name after name, and someone, someone gave birth to so-and-so. And the name Jabez um, means born in pain. <laughs> okay, so apparently his birth was so painful that his mom says, yeah, he gets named that. <laughs> I mean... You named our kid John, and you had 19 hours of labor. It must have been a heck of a thing. <laughs> Names the kid Jabez, and then Jabez's prayer, he calls upon Israel, says, Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my border, that your hand might be with me, and that you would keep me from harm, so that it might not bring me pain. So he's asking for something different than his family history. The next sentence is, And God granted what he asked, Chelub, the brother of Shuha. So the... Enlarged borders meant his child would be born without pain. And that's all it meant. It didn't refer at all to his, the land he, he, he that was metaphor. The borders that which he was looking for to break a chain of, of family history. This would actually be a great prayer, contextually speaking. It's a great prayer to, do, to, to help somebody who's dealing with breaking an addiction cycle. Mom was an alcoholic. My brother's an alcoholic. I don't want to be an alcoholic. Lord, help me in this way. Okay. Now, it's not, you, it's, not, it's not wrong to pray it and ask that God give us more responsibilities. That's, or, what, that's what I think we were doing. Yeah. yeah and we're, we're asking God to expand our territory, to expand our 
influence, but through him. Right. And he would use us in a wider realm. Right, and there's yes. nothing... That's what the... Yeah, exactly. And that's what the book encouraged back in the day. Right. Um, the problem is that it, a lot, and I, it's been too long since I've read the book, so I don't want to mischaracterize it, but as I remember reading it, because I read it at the time because people were asking me questions about it. This was all the way, I think, all the way back in, at Zion. Um, so our church in Michigan. <laughs> so it's a long time ago. Um, that what, what I remember was that it was almost like it required spiritual wisdom to apply it over into life. If you weren't going to deal with it narrowly within the context of breaking a family chain, um, you had to have some spiritual wisdom about it. Because I, I heard people praying wacky prayers, like double the size of my business, but there wasn't any double my, double my responsibility, Lord, so I can handle the burden. <laughs> you know? It was all focused on external reward instead of being focused on spiritual growth and responsibility. So... So you can. That's how we took it. Mm -hmm. You took it as spiritual growth and spiritual. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Mm -hmm. But I see what, what you're saying. It could, it could easily go that other direction. And there's nothing wrong with reading the scriptures inspirationally, like taking, taking courage from um, one where there, there's another one in Jeremiah where um, said, the Lord has plans for you to give you a hope and a future. Well, again, that was focused on the people who, who were being taken into captivity in Babylon. <laughs> so this is to keep their hope alive while they are being kept as prisoners in a foreign land. It's not meant to be strictly like a promise, like you're going you're gonna to be so successful. They're just hoping to get their home back. <laughs> you know? So remembering the original context, it can be a great inspirational quote. We, uh, one, of our, one of my former assistants, we, we helped redo her house one time because she was just in a bad bad way financially, and we did this as a, a, a thank you for the ministry she'd done around the church. We got a whole group, work group out to do it, and we painted that on the side of her of her garage, just as like so she could see it every morning because life had just been kind of hard to her at that point. So it's not wrong to use it that way, but it's wrong to forget when we use it as inspiration that it has a context and it serves a purpose of a larger story, not just my personal story, because. I think one of the great temptations in our culture is we are encouraged to constantly feel like we're the hero in a movie and that I, the, the world revolves around my story. And it's really important to remember that God's got, God's got to care for us personally, but he's got bigger fish to fry. He's going to bring all of history together, not just my personal, I hope I get to do everything I want to do with my life. So that's, uh, that's important for us to do when we deal with context. That's the dangers that I'll play. Jehovah's Witnesses tend to decontextualize things, don't they? They yeah, take often. Them out of context. Yeah, and the two things, yeah, they not only decontextualize, um, but they had to come up with their own translation of the Bible because they couldn't get the translations that everyone else was using to support their theology. Um, and we are going to look at authority next, so it's a good time to talk about that. <laughs> Um, any more questions about context? I do want to try and honor our time commitments here. So um, I don't mind staying late, but I know some of you have to go to choir. So. <laughs> and I know Carl's very excited about leading rehearsal. So. Uh, I'll give you the, I'll give you the, uh, the, um, the update. Bethany's doing well. She's in Illinois. And, Excited, and I think she said, did she send a link out to everyone in the choir so they could watch her concert on Saturday night? Yeah, so I'm thinking I, I need to send her, ask for her permission to put that on our website so the congregation can tune in if they want to. Because I don't think she has it, I don't think she has an every member uh, thing to put it in, so. Okay. Um, so authority. This is going to maybe seem like a no-brainer, but it's really not in our modern world. We read the scriptures as though they are they are our authority. Okay. This is what this is why the NALC is not a progressive Christian body. The centerpiece of progressive Christianity is reinterpreting the scriptures because 
our authority, we're supporting a different agenda. Um, the obvious place to turn on all this is the human sexuality stuff. I don't want to. I don't want to head down that discussion tonight. I don't go down that rabbit hole. But all scholars, even non I like biblical scholars who have no faith commitment. So they're not trying to do theology with the Bible. They're just trying to read the Bible honestly as a scholar. One of the great uh, scholars of the Gospel of Luke is a Jewish man. <laughs> okay? So you can have that. They're not, that doesn't necessarily mean that their scholarship, their, their scholarship is, is not connected to, to their um, faith commitment. They all agree that the Bible says what Christians have always believed regarding human sexuality. They all agree. That's clearly what the, what the Bible says. If you don't like what the Bible says, then you, have, you try to find a way to approach it to change what the Bible means. And that's the opposite of the way the church has used the scriptures throughout all its history. If you, go, if you remember back to the very first night we did this class, I talked about what is it that, um, how, why, do, why do Lutherans say sola scriptura by, by scripture alone? Why do we go back to the scripture? Because when you look back at church history, and you look at how the different councils settled theological disputes, they did it by quoting scripture to one another. So that means that even the, the bishops at the Council of Nicaea and Chalcedon and Constantinople and Constantinople too and all these places, all the big issues that were settled by the church were settled by quoting the scriptures. So that means that everybody was turning to them as the authority that you quote. How do you build your case for what your position is? You quote scripture. That means the scripture stands above you. Yeah. It's basic. Basically, it's very simple. The word of God has been the same from the beginning to the present and at the end. It right. doesn't change. Right. But everybody wants to change it. Right. Now, at times, the church's, the church's uh, interpretation has drifted one way or another on it. And then you see a course correction, right? That's what the Reformation represented. It was a course correction. Um, this is what I, my, one of my favorite, my, my ordination hymn, the, the Church is One Foundation. Uh, they, in the one hymn we, we say, um, this world sees her uh, with, a, with a scornful wonder, this world sees her, meaning the church, oppressed, was by schisms rent asunder, by heresies distressed. That's how they look at us. What we see living inside the uh, Living inside the church, we see it a little bit differently. Have you ever driven on a dark country road where they don't have the white lines painted on the side of the road? Have you ever done that? Yeah, exactly. So, like, oh, yeah, that's. Well, that's there's a reason they started painting those lines on. Because you almost don't know you're in the field because that road is gradually shift, shifting on you. So, you're, oh, gosh, I've got to get back in the middle of the road. You know? Um, this is the way we see it. We're, we, we're trying to stay to the teaching of the apostles, and we do. It's happened where the church drifts and forgets its history, forgets the meaning of the scriptures. Then and God raises up a new generation of people to go back and rediscover the context that maybe we forgot about, right? Um, to, to look at the dynamics of what's going on in there and say, no, I, I think we forgot something. And then... They build that case over time, and then the church goes, oh, yeah, that is wrong. We are going off the road here. I better get back to the center of the road. <laughs> okay. Um, so we're not, we're not going all over the map. The church is drifting a little and coming back and drifting a little and coming back like this. Um, it's kind of like a, an airplane. How, how many of you have ever flown in a commercial airliner? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he knows what I'm going to say. How often do you think your airliner is off course while you're in the air? What percentage of the time? Huh? I never worried about that. I, you never, you're, you're one step ahead of me. I never worry about it either, but it is off course 99% of the time. <laughs> never even thought about that. Your, your, your plane is headed to the wrong place 99% of the time. The way, it, the way it gets to its destination and we don't worry about whether we're getting there or not is like this. We knocks it off, we come back. Pilot goes get a cup of coffee, he drifts. <laughs> Can you come back? <laughs> that's how you get to your destination. And that's the same way the church deals with the scriptures. 
okay? Um, and so the, here's the biggest rub, especially in this moment in history. When I, when I hear discussions between, when I have discussions with my progressive colleagues, or when I hear discussions between um, traditional Christians and progressive Christians online, you just heard me talking about we interpret the scriptures, and that's true. Interpret just means read, all right? Um, it doesn't mean to stick our meaning into the, the words. I remember I, I started life as an English major, and I actually ended up leaving English major and becoming a, a, a music major, in part because the English department had gotten so political already by 1988, unless I wanted to be a Marxist and read everything as though it was a Marxist book, I wasn't going to fit in the English major. That was in 1988 at Penn State, which was at the time was considered a relatively conservative school. So I went over to music because you can either play Mozart or you can't. <laughs> you know? um, so there was a more objective standard there. But what, what keyed me and made me finally want to make to, to change was we were doing a, a reading of Jane Austen, and I love Jane Austen. I grew to love her much more later, but, but I, I was reading this thing. And the interpretive guide we were given to Jane Austen was something exactly the opposite of what Jane Austen believed. And I knew enough about her biography to know that. But it was saying we should interpret Jane Austen this way regardless of, it's what, regardless of it's whether she wanted to put that into the text because it's what we want. And so the, the tension becomes in the modern world between experience and the words, okay? We may know what the words mean, but our experience says they shouldn't mean that, so we're going to find a way to say they don't mean that. So what it comes down to is, do we use our experience to interpret the scriptures, or do the scriptures interpret our experience? It's one of two things. It's going to go one direction or the other. And the classic position of the church throughout all of time, this is not a Reformation thing, this is all of the church throughout all of time, is to say that the scriptures tell me what the meaning of my experience is. They don't tell me, my experience can't tell me what the meaning of the scriptures is. Because my experience always feels valid to me. Always feels valid to me. No matter how crazy my experience is. If I tell you my story, we, we, um, I, I do clinical work, uh, and we talk about the person as a living document, meaning they tell their story, and that's their story to them. Is that the real meaning of their story? Well, maybe not, but it's what they think their story is at that moment, right? So the way we... we and the, the two words that, that get put out there are if your authority, inter if, if your experience interprets the scriptures, I'm going to make it lowercase because, hey, we've just reduced its authority. If your experience interprets the scriptures, that's called eisegesis. That means reading into. So you're reading something into the scriptures that it clearly isn't there. Okay? If the scriptures interpret your experience, tell me what that experience means, that's exegesis. And for hundreds of years, you went to seminary and learned Greek and Hebrew and Latin if you were Roman Catholic so that you could do exegesis and not slide over into eisegesis. The modern period has reversed all that. And amongst progressive Christians, at least, which is, again, the, the title of this class is why, you know, what it means to be Lutheran and why we're NALC, is that the NALC wants to stick with this division. We don't want to do eisegesis where we're reading into the Bible what we want to see there. We want to stay in exegesis. We want to stay where we're letting the scriptures tell us what our experience means, regardless of how my experience feels. 
And that's hugely different. So questions, thoughts, ideas that this brings up for you? Well, the comment, I think the, the temptation of that is especially scripture passages that make them feel uncomfortable. I think there's, there are a lot of times where you just struggle when you read the Bible, I think, at moments where God just seems a little too harsh about something or, you know, things. So I think that's the temptation of it. But it's always why, again, we're called as a community where we surround ourselves by, by you know, in the NALC, of, of people who will call us back to that and always make us remember what it is because I say it's very easy, especially in today's culture where you don't like what you do, you, you, you are, we're consumers all the time. You don't like what you see in front of you, get something else, do something else, or change it to what you want it to be. Sure. So. Yeah, definitely. You ju you've explained just exactly, I think, where the ELCA and the NACL is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, is, that was the key distinction. Um, uh, your previous congregation uh, just took a vote to leave the ELCA and I was the, their pastor sent me the letter he was going to send to the bishop uh, before it happened and in it he said the Bible does not contain the word of God it is the word of God when you, when you play those little games you say well God's word is in there it's in, you know, the Bible is important but it's not all God's word you know, we know we, we we can we can do that. Then you start playing the game of which do I like better, which 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 is more important to me. Um, we're only part way through talking about authority, so I'm going to save some for next month. Next week we'll start with this authority piece um, and how we use scripture to interpret scripture, which is not again not just the Reformation's way of thinking about how to interpret scripture. That was already the the phrase in, in Latin is Ecclesia Reformata Semper Reformanda. Um, the church reformed is always reforming. That was already a phrase in the medieval church before Lutherans and Calvinists came along. <laughs> and scripture interpreting scripture was already the principle that was used when the bishops or the theologians would get together to argue a point. They were always using that. But how do you decide which scripture to use to interpret the other scripture? Part of its context. And we're going to talk more about that that sort of where it falls in the story kind of thing when we get to L. But, <laughs> but how do we how do we do this together? We start from a position of humility and recognizing that I am the student, the scripture is the teacher. Because to quote First Timothy, all scripture is God breathed and useful for teaching and reproof. And reproof is the hard part, right? That's when, when the Bible says something to me that hurts my feelings and I don't want to hear. That's when you need the authority of Scripture to tell you you're out of line. Um, and honestly, it's you know the sexual stuff is right in front of us now because of where our culture is at the moment, but the culture will change. And something else will be in our face. It's always important that the Bible be able to address us prophetically, to tell us what we don't want to hear. Nathan would not have been Nathan if he hadn't been able to go to King David and say, you are the guy who had this woman's husband put to death <laughs> so you could have her. And the scriptures do that to us, spiritually speaking. They, they come to us and tell us what we don't want to hear. Any other questions or comments? We'll pick up authority next week, so I'm probably going to go out to three sessions. I, am, I ta am I talking too much? Because I do want to answer. I want to keep asking questions so you guys can tell me, teach me what you want to, or at, tell me what you want to learn. Because I, I, I want to be on your agenda as we go, but I also want to give you enough backdrop to ask good questions. Um, well, I'm taking notes because in case you put me on the spot again. <laughs> Well, the recordings are on YouTube. They go back to us. <laughs> Not that what I'm doing is that great, but uh, but we can. But the, the big thing is that we know as we approach the scriptures. And again, I think most of us pick up this authority piece. It's more caught than taught. I think that if you if you're in a progressive congregation, you see by the way people treat the scriptures whether they have a high regard for it or a low regard for it. 
The Bible says that, but I don't really believe it. You know. Um, or is the church, the, is the Bible revered? You know. Um, do people say, well, you know, and then they quote something to you like, you know, this means something and you should know it. Like they're trying to reassure you, they're trying to, to challenge you, they're trying to teach you. Maybe they're reminding themselves, right? Um, in our in our minister, I'll, I'll end with this. In the minister's desk edition, which is the copy of the green hymnal that pastors get to give us instructions on how to use it, it was, I know some of the people who are on the editing board for that, although a lot of them are passing away now. Um, they, they, they were all high church people. They were assuming you would have the highest church practice. I've got a book this thick that tells me just how to lead the 21 pages of the communion <laughs> service. Um, gives me instructions. One of the things they give instructions for, something you rarely see in Lutheran churches, occasionally at a synod assembly or if you go to a really high church church, um, is that when you read the Bible, that you first of all, it specifies you're to have a Bible which is large enough and dignified enough that people recognize its authority. Then you carry it to the middle of the congregation and you're flanked by acolytes carrying candles that represent the light of Christ. And then there's a third acolyte, and when it's done properly, there's a third acolyte who does this and turns the Bible for the pastor to read it, you know? And then the pastor may lean over and kiss the Bible and hold it up high and say the gospel of the Lord. And you know, that's, that's when you're pulling out all the stops, you know? Um, but when you, if you were to see that done every week, you would know that we have a high regard for the scriptures. Like, this is not just another book we're reading. <laughs> so, um, again, we're, all, of our, all of our practices, but especially the way we treat the scripture, will help teach our children and any visitors to our church whether we really regard the scripture as our authority or not. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.